गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग एम आई ऑडिबल can you all hear me and see me if you can give okay uh, thank you shik so uh, this is <clears throat> dr shanmugam priya i am professor and head of the department of biochemistry at government thootukudi medical college educator for biochemistry and today i am here to discuss a few must know images for fmg and uh, go yeah everything is fine an objective for this session is to tell you about two tests and then i'll tell you about two disorders using two images and i will also be telling you about dated fact using an image and i will also show you a graph for today's session and before we start the session proper let me tell you about an academy plans so plus subscription gives an access to both live and with 25000 plus questions and most of these uh, questions are clinical case based and they are based uh, they are framed based on the latest exam pattern and most of these questions come with a detailed explanation an iconic subscription gives you an access to both an academy and prep ladder platform and these are our special class features uh, uh, if you attend our special class you will be able to interact live through chat and you can, if you use the raise a hand option you will be able to interact with the educator while real time and uh, these are the target neat pg 2022 batches which are conducted and uh, an instruments batch and apart from this on sunday we have a grant test series which is being conducted uh, for both fmg and for uh, ini set so i strongly recommend that all uh, ini set aspirants take up this uh, test okay so this is about the subscription plan and these are our star learners yeah so who scored uh, great marks impressive marks in the last june 2021 fmg so let's start discussing uh, next question is about a test as i told you the question is one anhydrin test reagent was taken in three test tubes few drops of c were added to the three tubes boiling water bath so a solution b solution and c solution were added to ninhydrin reagent and it was kept in a boiling water bath the resultant color is shown can you all see me and hear me so uh, the three solutions a and b bath and the resultant color is seen so what is solution a what is solution b and what? okay so um, first a color k has got give, has given color b has not given any color so what is the fact you need to know to detect the presence of free amino acids please remember it is done to detect the presence of free amino substances which have a free amino group can react with ninhydrin and when it reacts with ninhydrin ninhydrin causes deoxidation and then it forms a ruhemann purple once purple or a purple color what is your result what is your inference your inference is presence of a free amino acid with an amino group okay so when will you see yellow color too if there is an amino acid with nh group it's not biuret test it is uh, ninhydrin test which is different biopeptide linkages that's totally different the presence of free amino acids with free amino group so instead of amino group if an amino acid got, has got an e colored complex and what is your inference your inference is that there is no amino acid but an amino acid so name one amino acid which we have is proline or hydroxyproline then purple color if there is a purple color it means there is an amino acid if there is an yellow color it means it's an amino acid which is proline and if it is negative it means there is no amino acid yeah so c has to be an amino acid or proline so which choice will you choose among all four choices there is only one choice which has got proline and your answer can be reaffirmed by the fact that choice a is lysine yeah lysine is group so it is going to be 
solution A is lysine, solution B is a non-amino acid, it can be a carbohydrate, so it can yeah, so this is how you can answer such image-based question. So the carry home message here is ninhydrin is a test done to detect free amino acids with free amino group. If there is an amino group, it forms yellow color. Okay. So the next question is check the presence of proteins. So Prince was telling me about so they have shown you two tubes. This is the positive result, this is the negative result. So until until it is positive, it is purple. And they have given you that it's a test that is done to detect the presence of proteins. So if I ask you what is the group test done to detect proteins, your answer should be biuret. And which is the test that is done to detect the presence of carbohydrates? For carbohydrates, it is Mollish test. Do you understand this? So memorize all these facts. The group test done to detect the presence of proteins is biuret test. The test that is done to detect the presence of carbohydrates is Mollish test. Biuret test. What is the principle of biuret test? Here, the copper that is present, yeah, the copper that is present in biuret reagent in the presence of alkaline medium can react with those compounds which have two yeah, copper that is present in biuret reagent can react with compounds which have two or more peptide linkages in the presence of an alkaline medium in the presence of an alkaline medium to form a purple colored complex yeah to form a purple colored complex so this is the principle that lies behind biuret test so can you all try to tell me the composition of biuret reagent Biuret reagent should have a source of copper. What will act as a source of copper? It is copper sulfate which provides the blue color. There should be a provider of an alkaline medium. What provides the alkaline medium here? It is sodium hydroxide. And you need something to stabilize copper in the solution and that is sodium potassium tartrate. Yeah, that is sodium potassium tartrate. So tell me what is the composition of biuret reagent. You should remember that there should be a copper, there should be an alkaline medium and there should be something to stabilize copper in the solution. So composition of biuret reagent is copper sulfate, sodium hydroxide and sodium potassium tartrate. Please remember it is very similar to Benedict's test. Biuret test is done to detect the presence of proteins. Benedict's test is done to detect the presence of reducing substances. So even in Benedict's test, there should be copper. So what is the copper source in Benedict's reagent? It is the same copper sulfate. And even in Benedict's reagent, there should be a provider of an alkaline medium because all reducing substances exhibit their reducing property effectively in an alkaline medium. So what is the alkaline medium which is present in Benedict's reagent? It is sodium carbonate. And what stabilizes copper in the solution? It is sodium citrate. Yeah, it is sodium citrate. So if you can remember these together, if you can compare and contrast these two reagents, you will not forget both. So biuret Benedict's, yeah, they, they sound also similar. And biuret test is done to detect the presence of proteins. Benedict's test is done to detect the presence of reducing sugars. In both you need a copper source. In both it is copper sulfate, alkaline medium. In biuret Benedict's it is sodium carbonate. And in both you need something to stabilize copper in the solution. In biuret test it is sodium potassium sodium citrate. Okay. Now try to look at it. I want you to try answering it. So look at choices A it is true. The question is which of the following is true? Look at choice A. The composition is biuret and copper sulfate. Do you think it's true? Just now I told you the composition of biuret reagent, right? What is the composition of biuret reagent I told you? Can you all type it? It is copper sulfate, right? Second one is sodium hydroxide and the third one is sodium potassium tartrate. So it does not have biuret. So choice A can be excluded. How about choice B? Prolin gives a positive result. Do you think choice B is true? What do you know about prolin? Prolin is an amino acid. It does not have even one peptide linkage. And for anything to give a positive result with biuret test, there should be two or more peptide linkages. So prolin cannot give a positive result. Very good Prince Zuko. So B is false. 
okay look at choice c it is not answered by dipeptides this you for for you to answer uh, about this choice you will have to know what are dipeptides dipeptides have two amino acids yeah dipeptides have two amino acids with only one peptide linkages so remember biuret test will be answered only by tripeptides and above it cannot be answered by dipeptides so c is true does urea answer benedict's does urea answer biuret test yes that is why it is called as biuret so what does biuret mean it means usually what is the formula for urea what is the actual formula for urea formula for urea is c double bond o nh2 nh2 yeah formula for urea is c double bond o in the center that is attached to 2 nh2 and does this have any one peptide linkage it does not have any peptide linkage so normally urea does not answer bi biuret test but what happens when you heat urea in biuret reagent when you heat urea in biuret reagent two molecules of urea react together to form something called as biuret and this biuret has got two peptide linkages so it start answering biuret test that is why the name biuret okay so look at all the four choices now the composition is biuret and copper sulfate is false proline gives a positive result is false individual amino acids do not answer biuret test it is not answered by dipeptides is true yeah it is answered only by tripeptides and above does urea answer this test this is false yes urea can answer this test provided you heat urea in biuret reagent at 180 degree then it forms biuret and it answers this test okay so answer to this question is choice c so that's about biuret test now we have two clinical cases to discuss about yeah let me read the question a 60 year old male from a tribe population presents with multiple intervertebral disc bulges and a severe pain in the knee yeah so joint involvement on enquiry the person gives you a history of urine turning dark on standing so urine turning dark on standing is a classical key that is given to you so you should remember something called as black urine disease and what is black urine disease it is alkaptonuria very good shoket ahmed so what is black urine disease it is alkaptonuria alkapton means black urine yeah alkaptonuria means black urine disease on observation there is pigmentation of tip of the nose pinna thenar and hypothenar eminences urine benedict's test is positive I want you to remember that urine benedict's test will be positive in alkaptonuria because homogentisic acid is a reducing substance okay the clinician observed an eye sign yeah which is shown in the picture very good prince zuko rameshwar choudhury good so the clinician observed an eye sign and took a picture of it identify the possible disorder and mention the eye sign shown in the image so let me summarize the positive findings here the positive findings here are number one multiple joints involvement number two urine turning dark on standing number three hyperpigmentation of skin and mucous membrane so what is shown in the image is a pigmentation of sclera so there is pigmentation of even mucous membrane so all these would summarize and tell you one diagnosis which is alkaptonuria and what is that you know about alkaptonuria yeah try to memorize all the facts which i am telling you now alkaptonuria is an inborn error of metabolism caused by a defect of homogentisate oxidase yeah if you don't know memorize it now it is caused by a defect of homogentisate oxidase and it's an enzyme of tyrosine metabolism pathway and you don't have to know anything else about tyrosine metabolism to understand what is alkaptonuria just think logically and let me know when homogentisate oxidase is defective what would accumulate in the circulation yeah when homogentisate oxidase is defective homogentisic acid will accumulate in the circulation and when homogentisic acid accumulates it gets exposed to air or it gets oxidized to form benzoquinone acetate yeah it gets oxidized to form benzoquinone acetate 
and this benzoquinone acetate undergoes polymerization to form melanin like fibrils yeah what does it form it forms melanin like fibrils and this melanin like fibril is the reason for pigmentation everywhere so what happens when urine gets exposed to air homogentisic acid that is present in the urine on exposure to air gets oxidized to form benzoquinone acetate that on polymerization forms black color pigment that is why urine turns dark on standing an accumulation of benzoquinone acetate and alkaptan bodies in joints will cause cartilage destruction that is by multiple intervertebral disc bulges and multiple joints involvement okay and for the same reason there is pigmentation of skin thenar thenar and hypothenar eminences are pigmented and uh, there will also be pigmentation of pinna tip of the nose and additionally mucous membrane gets pigmented so only when you see pigmentation of the sclera along both medial and lateral rectus attachment yeah that is called as osler's sign that is called as osler's sign so if you asked which is the first symptom of alkaptonuria the first symptom of alkaptonuria is urine turning dark on standing symptom is something which the patient comes and tells you so that would be urine turning dark on standing if you ask which is the first sign of alkaptonuria your, on, your answer should be osler sign and what is osler sign scleral pigmentation along both medial and lateral rectus attachment okay so now do you know the answer to this question yeah what is answer to this question it is choice c it is alkaptonuria and osler sign uh galactosemia of course will answer benedict's test urine in galactosemia will answer benedict's test but you are not going to find such pigmentation and oil drop cataract is not going to present as pigmentation galactosemia of course presents with oil drop cataract but it's not going to present as pigmentation okay so this probably is an image which is often used yeah for uh, 3d's of telegraph yeah so let's read the question i'll give some time for you to think and tell me the answer the question is a 40 year old male presented with a severe form of dermatitis as shown in the picture so this is the dermatitis picture that is shown to you and classically don't you see that it looks like a necklace yeah it looks like a necklace so what is it this is called as castles necklace and castles necklace immediately what should come into your mind it should be pellagra yeah castles necklace is a characteristic feature of pellagra which is caused by niacin deficiency and please remember niacin deficiency or pellagra will present with 3 d's what are the 3 d's of pellagra the first d stands for diarrhea even in pellagra the first symptom would be diarrhea only then they present with dermatitis and dermatitis in pellagra is classical yeah initially it presents as rashes with defined margin yeah it presents as rashes with defined margin in in those areas which are exposed to sunlight for example around the neck or in the foot later it becomes hyperpigmented that is when it looks like a necklace and we call it as castles necklace okay so diarrhea is the first symptom followed by dermatitis and dementia dementia part will initially begin as uh, lack of sleep they complain of insomnia then they complain of hallucination and memory loss yeah that is why we call it as dementia so the three d's of pellagra would be diarrhea dermatitis and dementia and pellagra is caused by niacin deficiency so these are the introductory facts which i am giving giving you now based on these facts try to answer the question all of the following are causes except Do you think maize based diet can cause pellagra wheat based diet can cause pellagra sorghum based diet can cause pellagra hartnup's disease so all of the following are causes except can any one of you try answering this yep is it a or b or c or d okay grace says it's b good Shoket Ahmed also says it's B. Prince Zuko also says it's B. Very good. So answer is B. But for you to understand how does A, C, how do A, C, and D cause pellagra, 
I will tell you the steps involved in niacin synthesis. I'm not going to get in the details. I'll just tell you the outline. But before this, uh, you want you have to know that niacin is one essential micronutrient which can be synthesized by your body. Generally, essential micronutrients cannot be synthesized by your body. It needs to be supplemented only in diet. Right? Exception is. Uh, niacin. Niacin is something which can be synthesized in your body from tryptophan. Yeah, we always say 60 milligram of tryptophan is equivalent to 1 milligram of niacin. Yeah, 60 milligram of tryptophan is equivalent to 1 milligram of niacin. So now I'm going to tell you the outline of steps involved in the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. So have a look at this. The first step is tryptophan gets into niacin synthetic pathway wherein tryptophan goes through two steps and it gets converted to kininurin. What you first get is kininurin and this kininurin goes through several steps and it gets converted to a ring and the ring that you form is quinolinate. Yeah, the ring which you get is quinolinate. Okay, and for the conversion of kininurin to quinolinate, you need an enzyme which is kininurinase. What is enzyme you need? You need kininurinase. And this kininurinase needs pyridoxal phosphate. Yeah, it needs B6. Okay, then quinolinate being a ring should be converted to niacin mononucleotide and niacin adenine dinucleotide. So what is a nucleotide? You take a ring like this. Yeah, you take a ring like this and you attach this ring to ribose 5-phosphate. If you attach this ring to ribose 5-phosphate, what you get is a nucleotide. So after you get quinolinate, quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase attaches ribose 5-phosphate and converts it into niacin mononucleotide. Yeah, converts it into niacin mononucleotide that then gets converted to niacin adenine dinucleotide and that becomes NADP also. So what are the coenzyme forms of niacin? Coenzyme forms of niacin are niacin mononucleotide, niacin adenine dinucleotide or NAD and then NADP. Okay, so for this conversion you need kininurinase and quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase. Now you are going to tell me what are the causes of niacin deficiency. Yeah, so niacin deficiency can be because of tryptophan deficiency. Yeah, example is maize based diet. Yeah, maize based diet. So maize or corn can be a staple diet among farmers because it's less costlier. But maize has got maize has got very low tryptophan. The tryptophan bioavailability from maize is low. So if a farmer is on maize based diet for a very long period of time, the person can present with pellagra. Okay. So what if the person takes uh, tryptophan normally? What happens when there is tryptophan malabsorption? Yeah, if tryptophan is not getting absorbed properly along the intestine and that is called as Hartnup's disease. So all of you, please remember what is Hartnup's disease? Hartnup's disease is tryptophan malabsorption wherein there is a defect of a neutral amino acid transporter which is specific for absorbing tryptophan along the intestine. So when tryptophan cannot get into the circulation, it cannot form niacin that causes pellagra. Okay. Now what if tryptophan is entered into the circulation properly? And after that tryptophan is not being used for niacin synthesis and tryptophan is being used for something else. What can you use tryptophan for? You can use tryptophan for serotonin synthesis. Yeah, what is serotonin? Serotonin is 5-hydroxytryptamine. So how do you synthesize serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine? Tryptophan becomes 5-hydroxytryptophan. Then it undergoes decarboxylation to form serotonin. So what happens in carcinoid syndrome? Yeah, what happens in carcinoid syndrome? In carcinoid syndrome, most of the tryptophan will be used for serotonin synthesis. So tryptophan is not available for niacin synthesis and that causes pellagra. So let's assume that everything is perfect. Yeah, the person has taken enough tryptophan. Tryptophan has been absorbed. Tryptophan has not been used for anything else. It has entered into niacin synthetic pathway also. What if there is B6 deficiency? If there is B6 deficiency, kininurinase will be inactive. So the precursor kininurin cannot be converted to niacin. 
so that also causes pellagra pyridoxal phosphate deficiency so pellagra is not only caused by niacin deficiency it's also caused by b6 deficiency because kinin urinase needs b6 okay now let's assume that this is perfect and quinolinate has been formed what if quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase is inhibited so quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase is inhibited by leucine yeah it is inhibited by leucine so sorghum yeah sorghum can be a staple diet among farmers and it's quite common in india yeah particularly in andhra pradesh yeah in andhra pradesh sorghum or indian millet yeah indian millet is grown everywhere so seasonally the uh, farmers depending upon how much harvest they have they start feeding more on sorghum and sorghum is rich in leucine and leucine inhibits quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase and that causes pellagra and this is called as leucine pellagra you understand this this is called as leucine pellagra so tell me what are the causes of niacin deficiency or pellagra i want you to remember one basic fact niacin can be synthesized from tryptophan so what are the cause of niacin deficiency tryptophan deficiency when do you expect tryptophan deficiency maize based diet or when tryptophan is not absorbed properly what do you call that condition as tryptophan malabsorption what is tryptophan malabsorption it is hartnup's disease now tryptophan has entered into the system what if tryptophan is used for something else what can you use tryptophan for serotonin synthesis yeah serotonin is nothing but 5 hydroxy tryptamine so in carcinoid syndrome most of the tryptophan we use for serotonin synthesis so tryptophan is not available for niacin synthesis okay so carcinoid syndrome is a cause now tryptophan has entered into niacin synthetic pathway if there is b6 deficiency it cannot be used for niacin synthesis everything is perfect it has formed quinolinate quinolinate phosphoribosyl transferase is inhibited by leucine so leucine pellagra is caused by sorghum based diet which is quite common in andhra pradesh and maharashtra okay so that's called as leucine pellagra so these are the causes of pellagra are you clear so causes of pellagra will include maize based diet uh, hartnup's disease serotonin synthesis which is carcinoid syndrome b6 deficiency and leucine pellagra okay so what is the answer for this question it is not wheat based diet as most of you answered it yeah reason is wheat has got adequate tryptophan so something which is of interest uh, to me i would like to share this with you uh, wheat is low in lysine yeah wheat is low in lysine like what i told you maize is low in tryptophan wheat is low in lysine and there is one uh, i won't call it as vegetable there is one tuber which is rich in lysine yeah that is potato potato can act as a good source of lysine so now do you understand the significance of indian diet yeah what do we do in india we always try to have potato along with chapati or puri right so this is because it gives us it uh, it makes it a balanced diet one is low in lysine the other one is rich in lysine okay so indians are quite uh, proactive yeah they are very brilliant so all of the following are causes except choice b which is wheat based diet okay so this is a clinical lab based question and this was asked once uh, name the additive in the blood collection tube shown in the picture can you try answering this name the additive in the blood collection tube shown in the picture is it k2 edta or sodium citrate or sodium fluoride or silica the clue that i want to give you all is it's a red topped tube yeah the red color okay shokat ahmed says oh the answer is for the previous question or for this question you all think it's choice b or sodium citrate okay um the answer to this question is d silica red top tube will have silica and the role of silica is that it is a clot activator yes it is a clot activator okay so i'll tell you what does a red top 
tube mean so if it's a red top tube it means there is no anticoagulant do you understand this red top tube means it is no anticoagulant which means this red top tube is used for getting serum sample yeah, it is used for getting a serum sample so can you tell me what are the differences between serum and plasma do you all know the differences between serum and plasma I'll give you a clue to memorize it yeah if you collect a blood sample yeah if you collect a blood sample in which you have placed an anticoagulant what separates above is called as plasma do you understand this if you collect blood sample in a tube in which you have placed an anticoagulant what separates above is called as plasma so what is serum if you collect a blood sample in a simple tube yeah the negative charges of the tube will stimulate in vitro clotting and after in vitro clotting you get a clot hard clot so after you form a hard clot what separates above is called a serum so serum is something which separates after clotting which means serum does not have clotting factors yeah serum does not not all proteins um, prince zuko yeah serum does not have clotting factors serum does not have fibrinogen so what is the basic difference between serum and plasma serum does not have clotting factors plasma has got clotting factors so if you estimate protein concentration in a serum and in a plasma protein concentration plasma will be more because the protein will include all clotting factors okay now uh, what is the advantage of using a plasma why do you add something you do not allow it to clot what is the advantage of adding an anticoagulant the advantage is if it's a serum sample when you have to wait for the clot to form yeah so you collect blood sample and then you should keep the blood sample if it's a serum tube you collect the blood sample you keep the blood sample undisturbed for some time so that in vitro clotting happens only after clotting gets over you can centrifuge and you can get the serum so it will take a longer time for you to get the serum sample so it is going to be a delayed processing yeah it is going to be a delayed processing time for serum whereas if it's plasma you just collect the blood sample you just put it in a centrifuge allow it to get uh, separated and what comes above is plasma you don't have to wait for it to clot okay so it is going to be a quick processing and that is why we prefer to use plasma so when do you prefer to use serum if it's biochemical investigations yeah if it's biochemical investigation for example uh, estimating electrolytes sodium potassium or you're estimating plasma proteins or you're estimating something else yeah if it's a plasma sample all these anticoagulants yeah all these anticoagulants chelate calcium they chelate calcium so they cause low calcium levels there will be high protein and low calcium and once there is low calcium most of the enzymes will not be active so enzyme analysis yeah enzyme estimation calcium estimation electrolyte estimation for all biochemical investigations you will have to use only serum and that is why when you did your when you must have finished your uh, or you will be doing your internship again right fmg students so when you start collecting blood sample if it's a blood sample that has to be sent to a biochemistry lab you will be asked to collect blood sample only in a red top tube do you understand this because all these anticoagulants interfere with all the analysis so for biochemical investigations yeah for biochemical investigations we prefer a serum sample but then even in a biochemistry laboratory we can't be waiting for a very long time for it to clot and then serum to get separated right that is why in a red top tube which does not have an anticoagulant we use a clot activator yeah we use a clot activator so what does the clot activator do it quickens the clotting process so that even after 15 minutes of sample collection you can centrifuge it you can get your serum you can quickly analyze it and the clot activator that is used in all red top tubes is silica most of the red top tubes have silica as the clot activator it is a neutral clot activator which does not interfere with any analysis but it quickens the process is it clear are you now clear about what is a red top tube so if it's a red top tube immediately what should come into your mind red top tube does not have an anticoagulant if there is no anticoagulant clotting happens and what separates above is serum so red top tube is used for serum collection 
yeah, or serum separation. So what is the disadvantage of using a serum blood collection tube? The disadvantage is it will take a longer time for the clot to happen. So to quicken the clotting process, we use a clot activator. What is a clot activator that is used? Silica. So red top tubes will have silica. Okay. Now, now that you have learnt about red top tube, I will be happy if you learn about other tubes also. When they can ask you about red top tube, they can any day ask you about other tubes. So I will show you the tube. You try to tell me what is the additive that is used. So look at this tube. What color is this? The color is lavender. So have you collected blood sample in a lavender top tube? You must have collected sample in lavender top tube. You would have sent it to the pathology laboratory. And what do you, very good. And what do you estimate in pathology? Complete blood count. Right? So for most of the pathology investigation, you will have to collect blood sample in a lavender top tube. It has got K2 EDTA. As you have all mentioned, it has got K2 EDTA, which is an anticoagulant that needs to be used for complete blood count estimate for uh, complete blood count related investigations. Okay, so that is lavender top tube, it's EDTA tube. And apart from this, the same K2 EDTA tube is also used for estimating glycated hemoglobin. Yeah, HbA1c estimation. So in biochemistry, I said mostly we get blood sample in a red top tube. But sometimes we also receive K2 EDTA tube. When will we receive it? If it's for glycated hemoglobin or HbA1c estimation. As the name indicates, for HbA1c estimation, you would want a whole blood sample. Right? What if there is serum and there is clot? Serum does not have hemoglobin. Serum does not have RBC. So it will not act as a source of hemoglobin. So if you want hemoglobin, what should you do? You, should, you need a whole blood sample for which you need an anticoagulant which is K2 EDTA. So K2 EDTA tube is also used for HbA1c estimation and also for all sensitive parameters like ammonia. Yeah, ammonia estimation or parathormone estimation, any analyte which is very sensitive to activation of enzymes. Yeah, we would use K2 EDTA tube. If you remember that K2 EDTA is for CBC, it's for complete blood count and for HbA1c estimation, that's more than enough. Okay, so that's about lavender top tubes. And what color is this? This is a blue topped tube. And what does a blue top tube have? Yeah, it has got sodium citrate. It's a citrated tube. Yeah, 3.2 percentage sodium citrate is present in blue top tube. And this is used for coagulation studies. Yeah, it is used for coagulation studies. Because what does citrate do? Citrate chelates calcium does not allow clotting to happen. And in the lab, whenever coagulation study needs to be done, what we do is we add calcium. Yeah, we add calcium and then we see how quickly clot is formed. And then we'll be able to understand which parameter is low, which parameter is high. Do you understand this? So citrated tube, sodium citrate 3.2 percentage is used for coagulation studies. You're right, Prince. And this is a gold top tube or yellow top tube. And if there is an yellow top, do you see a gel here? Are you able to find out a gel in the bottom here? Yeah, so what is this? This is a gel and clot tube. This is a gel and clot tube. So what does this tube do? The gel has got a specific gravity, yeah, which will allow the gel to stay between the cells in the bottom and serum or plasma on the top. So you collect blood sample in gel and clot tube and then you centrifuge. When you centrifuge, the gel that is present in the bottom will slowly rise because of the difference in specific gravity. It slowly rises and it stands between cells in the bottom and serum or plasma on the top. Okay, thereby it acts as a mechanical barrier between cells and serum. Okay, so what is the advantage? The advantage is it will not allow cells to metabolize and use any analyte in the serum. Okay, so when will you use gel and clot tube? You use gel and clot tube whenever you want to store the blood sample for a longer period of time. Yeah, if you collect blood sample in a red top tube, yeah, you are, uh, you are allowing the clot to happen and then if you are storing it as such, cells are in contact with serum and cells will utilize whatever is present in the serum and in due course the cell will undergo lysis and the serum will not be usable. 
so if you have to store the sample which is quite common in laboratories yeah in laboratories for accreditation purposes we are supposed to so store all samples at least for 24 hours to 48 hours so these days we have shifted from red top tube to gel and clot tube because primary tube the tube in which the sample has been collected can be just kept and stored after analysis yeah, so if there is a repeat analysis that needs to be done we can just take it out we can analyze it keep it back so that's the advantage of gel and clot tube so gel and clot tube is used whenever you're trying to store it whenever the primary tube has to be stored and this is used for all biochemical analysis it is used for all biochemical analysis because if there is gel even if cells undergo lysis the lysed part will not come and uh, contaminate the serum or plasma. It acts as a mechanical barrier. Okay. Now, what is this tube? Great topped tube. Have you very good? I am happy, Prince Zuko. You are rocking. So, if it's a great top tube, it means it has got sodium fluoride. Yeah, it has got sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate. Yeah, it has got sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate. These days we have got many variations of fluoride tubes. We even have sodium fluoride and sodium EDTA tube. But ultimately what is that you should remember? Grey top means it has got fluoride. And what is the significance of fluoride? Fluoride inhibits enolase. Please remember fluoride inhibits enolase of glycolysis. So what is the significance of you inhibiting enolase of glycolysis? Tell me, uh, you collect blood sample from the ward or you collect blood sample in the OP and then the blood sample is sent to the laboratory. In the laboratory, the sample is received, the sample is processed and then the sample is analyzed. So even in an in-house laboratory, between sample collection and sample analysis, there will be a window period of at least one and a half to two hours. And in that window period, RBCs in the sample will be in touch with the plasma or the serum. Okay, so RBCs, the only fuel they can utilize is glucose. So until they are in touch with the serum or plasma, they keep utilizing the glucose of the serum or plasma. So after two hours, if you estimate glucose, that is going to be a false low value. Yeah, to avoid getting false low value, we collect blood sample in a tube which has got fluoride. And this fluoride inhibits enolase of RBCs. So RBCs are not allowed to use glucose. So then if you estimate the glucose, that is going to reflect the true value. Yeah, so to avoid getting false low values. To avoid getting false low values of glucose. Yeah, we collect blood sample in a great top tube. And the blood sample that is collected in a great top tube is supposed to be used only for glucose estimation. You understand this great top tube should not be used for anything else. If you collect blood sample in a great top tube, it has to be used only for glucose estimation. Okay. And if it's a great, if it's a green top, it means it has got heparin. Yeah, green, it has got heparin. And heparinized sample can be used for chromosomal studies, cytogenetics. Sometimes it's also used for lipid profile, rarely. Suppose it's a stat sample. What do you mean by stat sample? If you want the result immediately, if you can't wait for the clot to happen, if you want the result immediately, we collect blood sample in a green top tube because heparin does not that much interact with biochemical or interfere with biochemical analysis. So for all stat samples or quick analysis, we collect blood sample in green top tube for biochemical analysis. Or uh, if it's chromosomal studies, we collect blood sample in a green top tube. Okay. So red top tubes do not have anticoagulants. They provide serum is the carry home message. And to quicken the clotting process, it will have uh, silica. So name the additive in the blood collection tube that is shown in the picture. What will be your answer? Your answer has to be silica. K2 EDTA will be lavender top, sodium citrate is blue top, sodium fluoride is grey top. Okay. Okay. So finally it is one question which is on graph. Yeah. So uh, I always say this whenever you are shown a graph don't try to interpret the graph directly. 
trying to analyze what is on the x axis and what is on the y axis. So in this graph tell me what is on the x axis. On the x axis they have provided substrate concentration. Okay. On the y axis what have they provided? They have provided velocity. So this is nothing but substrate concentration versus velocity of an enzyme. Yeah, velocity of an enzyme. Okay, as expected, when you increase the substrate concentration, do you see that initially there is an increase in the rate of the enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction? But after a point, even if you increase the substrate concentration, the velocity does not increase much. Yeah, so it reaches a saturation point. It reaches a plateau or it reaches a saturation point. So why does it reach a saturation point? Because at this point, all the substrate binding sites have been saturated with the substrate. So this is how all your enzymes would work. So in all your enzymes, as you increase the substrate concentration, the rate of the enzyme catalyzed chemical reaction will increase linearly up till a point. Beyond that, even if you increase the substrate concentration, there is not much of an increase in the velocity and reaches, reaches a plateau. It is because of saturation of enzyme with substrate. And at that point, wherein all enzyme substrate binding sites get saturated with the substrate, the velocity is called as Vmax. Do you see that point here? Yeah, the point here is marked as what? Vmax. And Vmax is never measurable. Do you see that this curve does not go and touch this point at all? Yeah, this curve will be extending like this forever. Yeah, it does not go and cut the maximal velocity because never can you saturate all your enzymes with substrate. Because, because all your enzymes are catalysts. They get used, they get regenerated. They get used, they can regenerate. They can get regenerated. So both in vivo and in vitro experiments, we have never been able to saturate all the enzymes with the substrates. That is why Vmax is never achievable. Vmax is never measurable. And that is why we try to have something called as half Vmax. Do you see that here? They marked everything. Yeah, that is why what do we have? We have half Vmax. So you have all started answering any example for substrate and enzyme? Mugil Vanan, example for substrate and enzyme can be hexokinase and glucose. Hexokinase is an enzyme, glucose is a substrate. Okay, so many of you have answered it as D. All of the following are true about X. This is X. All of the following are true about X. Many of you have answered it as D. And uh, Prince Zuko says it is C. Okay, wait for a minute, I'll tell you what it means. Okay, so half Vmax, that is why we have something called as half Vmax. Now from half Vmax, you draw a horizontal line to cut the curve. And from the curve, you put a vertical line down, it cuts the x-axis. Yeah, this is x. And what is x? Try to read x. x is nothing but the substrate concentration. Yeah, x is nothing but the substrate concentration at half maximal velocity. Yes or no? x is nothing but substrate concentration at half maximal velocity. And that is km. Don't you all know this? I know you must have all memorized this definition, right? km or Michaelis constant. Yeah, what is Km or Michaelis constant? Km or Michaelis constant is the substrate concentration at half maximal velocity. Okay, and what is the unit in which uh, Km is expressed? I said it is substrate concentration. If it is substrate concentration, what is the unit in which it will be expressed? It will be expressed in micromoles. Km is always expressed as substrate concentration. It's going to be expressed as micromoles. Okay, now I'll give you an example like Mugil Vanan asked me to give, give an example for enzyme and substrate. Let me give you an example for Km value. Okay, suppose I say Km of an enzyme is 50 micromoles. Yeah, I say Km of an enzyme is 50 micromoles. I mean to say when the substrate concentration is 50 micromoles, the enzyme can achieve half maximal velocity. What do I mean when I say Km of another enzyme is 100 micromoles? 
yeah what do i mean when i say came of another enzyme is 100 micromoles i mean to say only when the substrate concentration is as high as 100 micromoles this enzyme is going to achieve half maximal velocity which means for an enzyme with higher km you will have to provide more substrate why do you have to provide more substrate it is because affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is low do you understand this if you say km is high you mean to say you have to provide more substrate why do you have to provide more substrate it is because affinity of the enzyme for the substrate is low so how is km and affinity related km and affinity are inversely related are you all clear about this yeah km and affinity are inversely related now try to look at all these statements and tell me which is true and which is false look at choice a lower the km we know now x is km so lower the km higher is the affinity true or false yeah lower the km higher is the affinity this is true lower the km higher is the velocity is it true lower the km higher is the velocity no do you understand this if km is low it means even if you give low substrate it can reach half maximal velocity so it is not inversely proportional to the velocity okay so this is false b is false how about c it is calculated using double reciprocal plot which is true because I said B max is never measurable, KM can also be not measured directly. Yeah, that is why we use double reciprocal plot or line weaver Berg plot. I will be telling you about this probably in one of the special classes that I have planned for you all, FMG aspirants. Yeah, so in special class, we have a, a series of 10 hours of biochemistry wherein I plan to complete the entire biochemistry in 10 hours. So at that point of time, I'll tell you about double reciprocal plot or line weaver Berg plot. And for now, please remember, this is the plot that is used to measure Vmax and Km of an enzyme. Okay, so this is true. And Km is expressed in micromoles. That is also true. I told you, right, substrate concentration. Concentration is always expressed in moles. So it is expressed in micromoles. So this is true. So what is the right answer? All of the following are true about KM except your answer should be choice B. Lower the X, higher is the velocity. Okay. And with this today's session is over. Okay. So hope you have understood many facts and concepts. And I will be happy if you try to integrate all your topics and all your subjects and try to learn it in, an, uh, in a cohesive way because this will help you in applying whatever you have learned in your future also. Okay. So thank you. Good night. See you all soon.